Good evening. A warm welcome to all of you. Today, the CIC is pleased to partner with the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage, INTAC, Chennai chapter, to bring to you a unique topic. It's on the evolution of Calcutta and its environs. To speak about this is Mr. Kapoor, Mr. G.M. Kapoor, and I would like to introduce him here. He is a long-time resident of Kolkata. He had his education in engineering and management from the IIT BHU and IIM Calcutta. His business career included a stint with the State Bank of India and in private industry. He advises Innovation Norway in the area of business development and business matchmaking, as well as mentoring and entrepreneurship. He is currently president of the Calcutta Management Association. With a deep interest in history and a passion for heritage sown during his college years, he shifted gears and took the path of heritage conservation and restoration. Which Calcutta, Kolkata, then Calcutta, was being subjected to. He walked, he joined what was called an army of conscience keepers to the nation to protect what is rightfully ours, our heritage, the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage intact as a perfect platform for furthering the cause of heritage conservation. He plays an active role in heritage conservation with the setting up of the Intact Conservation Institute, the largest center in Kolkata for the conservation of material heritage in private domain. Mr. Kapoor's role as an activist in this area is widely acknowledged and he has been to serve on various government panels and industry associations. Symbiotic relationship between heritage and tourism has been developed deriving economic value from tangible and intangible heritage. He has recently been conferred the prestigious Distinguished Alumnus Award from IIM Calcutta. We have great pleasure in inviting Mr. Kapoor. Please, I have the privilege of inviting Mrs. Sujata from the Chennai Intact Chapter who has been responsible for getting us this eminent speaker and also organizing this event. I would invite her to say a few words about INTAC and what they do here. Thank you. Please. A very good evening and greetings from the Chennai chapter of INTAC. Thanks very much to Chennai International Center for collaborating with INTAC for today's talk. We're extremely honored that Mr. M. K. Narayan, former governor of West Bengal, is here with us today. Thank you for your gracious presence, sir. Thanks to Mrs. Amu for being here. A special welcome to Mr. G. M. Kapoor from us here in Madras, the queen of the Coromandel. He has taken the trouble to come all the way from what is termed Europe on the Ganges, the cultured city of Calcutta. Mr. Kapoor, who has already been introduced, is very much part of the intact family, being the Calcutta convener and chairman of the chapter's advisory committee of intact. Delighted to see each one of you who has taken the time to be here this evening. I would like to take a moment to remember a respected member of INTAC, Chennai, Dr. M. S. Swaminathan, who unfortunately passed away a few weeks ago. We recall with gratitude his association with us at INTAC and his well-known contribution to the country's green revolution. Some of you may be familiar with INTAC, but I thought I'd give a brief for the benefit of those who may not be. INTAC is an acronym for the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage. INTAC was established in 1984, 39 years ago, as a not-for-profit organization. INTAC's mission to conserve heritage is based on the belief that living in harmony with heritage enhances quality of life. 
It is stated in the Constitution of India, Article 51A F, that open courts, it shall be the duty of every citizen of India to value and preserve the rich heritage of our composite culture, close quotes. The key word here is composite and reflects the rich and diverse heritage that we have in India. Intac endeavors to achieve this vision by doing various things, by sensitizing the public about the pluralistic cultural legacy of India, by protecting and preserving India's built heritage, natural heritage, living heritage, both tangible and intangible heritage, <coughs> by documenting unprotected heritage buildings of archaeological, architectural, historic, and aesthetic significance, as well as of cultural resources, developing heritage policies and regulations, by providing expertise in the field of conservation, restoration, and preservation, by encouraging capacity building, by developing skills through training programs across the country, inculcating in the younger generation a sense of pride in our heritage. We have about 50 heritage clubs in various schools in Madras. And currently, we've also um, sort of brought into our fold the corporation schools. Bringing heritage education to the forefront in order to ensure long-term concern for heritage and undertaking emergency response measures during natural or man-made disasters, supporting the local administration when heritage is threatened. Again, recently, we've undertaken restoration works in Nepal after the devastating earthquakes that they have faced. We have formed over 200 chapters nationwide, and it is through the passion and strength of volunteers across our chapters that intact takes its vision forward. At Chennai chapter, we have through talks, programs and initiatives been creating awareness about the significance of our heritage. Do join hands with us at intact Chennai chapter to save and protect our heritage. We are here to answer your queries and information. If you need any, there's a desk at the lobby. Today we bring focus on Calcutta. I thought I'd read a few lines from Desmond Doig's tome on the city. So to Calcutta, who came first? The Armenians or the British? The Bengali, of course. He has always been there, but Calcutta, the city, sprung from Job Chanok's landing, which Mr. Kapoor will speak about. No one, to my knowledge, has ever painted him doing it. No painstaking engraving, no dalliesque flight of surrealistic fancy. At no time, not even in the high noon of the British Empire, did anyone think of setting up a statue or naming a park, a road, or even a crooked lane after him. I could be wrong since the Calcutta Corporation has exorcised so much of living history by the simple expedient of changing city place names. Sounds very familiar to those of us in Madras. Kipling did toss him a jingle. From the noonday halt of Charnock grew a city. The drama, a monsoon day, gray river, gray sky, and a small armada of sailing ships Battling up the Hooghly, I fancy tigers watching from the dank jungle on the river banks, crocodiles fatly scurrying up as the ship's boats pulled for shore, a lumbering takeoff of adjutant cranes, and a man of destiny mindful only of the rain and river mud as he scrambled ashore. He came at the invitation of the Nawab Viceroy of Bengal under the Emperor Aurangzeb and with the consent of the English authorities 
at Fort St. George, Madras. That's our connection there. And yet another connection, the Charnock Mausoleum stands tall in St. John's Churchyard in Calcutta. The black tombstone was brought from Madras to Calcutta. Thomas Holland of the Geological Survey of India in 1893 presented a paper on it at the Asiatic Society of Bengal. Holland, who visited several parts of South India and studied different kinds of rocks, came to the conclusion that from its proximity to the coast and to Madras, it seemed likely that Pallavaram would have been selected by the earlier agents of the East India Company as a source of this handsome rock used for Job Charnock's tombstone in Calcutta. Holland ends his study stating, I would suggest for it the name Charnockite in honor of the founder of Calcutta. Charnockite, it has remained, this black niece from Pallavaram near Chennai. Over to Mr. Kapoor. Thank you. I request Mr. M. K. Narayanan to say a few words. Thank you, Sujata. I'm depriving this audience of an opportunity to, to listen to Mr. Kapoor, for which they've been eagerly waiting. But my connection with Calcutta is, as we heard just now, that there's a great deal going on between Chennai or what is Madras and Calcutta. I, I live in Chennai, but I lived or I served in um, Calcutta as the governor. So I have a great deal of affection for, for Calcutta because I think it in many ways, as was once said, the finest city in, in the East. I think it's finer than even London. It is a miniature London. Uh, not well looked after, with apologies to Mr. Kapoor. But I think it's, it, it is a city with a soul. It is a city which has some of the most gorgeous items of uh, architecture. The people are wonderful. It takes a little time to adjust to their vagaries. But I think the real, uh, the best part of Calcutta are the people and the buildings. Mr. Kapoor plays a remarkable role in this regard. I got to know him when I was the governor in, in Calcutta. And I dare say that whatever we have salvaged of Calcutta is largely due to Mr. Kapoor and Mr. Kapoor's efforts. It's a pity that, thanks to the vagaries of the weather today, and uh, I mean the general lethargy because this is the holiday season, that we don't have a bigger audience but that's their loss, not ours. I think Mr. Kapoor is in many ways the savior of, of Calcutta, the savior of our ancient monuments of ancient culture. And I'm sure that all of you will benefit a great deal from what he has to say. I, I know what he has done for us in the Raj Bhavan in Calcutta. And I've seen many of the, of the items that he has resurrected in the city of Calcutta. But overall, he represents, as I said, the soul of India, the soul of ancient India. It's a privilege, I think, for all of us to, to be able to have him here today. And I thank Sujata particularly for having managed to get him over. I was not prepared to speak, but Sujata railroaded me into doing so, but I'm glad that I have an opportunity to speak of both Calcutta and Mr. Kapoor. I shall not stand between Mr. Kapoor and this audience, but I wish to only say that after Mr. Kapoor finished speaking, instead of visiting um, Italy or France, etc., please visit Calcutta. It may not look as beauty as some of the places, but I think it is history in the making. It is living history in many ways. And you will not miss the fact that you do not live in Calcutta. I wish I had gone to Calcutta much earlier in my life and existence. 
Actually, when I was appointed as a governor, I wasn't even too sure whether I should be happy or, or, and, or unhappy about it. But I think there is, a, there is providence above, and they sent me to Calcutta. I've come back totally in love with Calcutta and with the Bengali spy now. Thank you, Mr. Kapoor, for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Narayan, for the very kind words. I, uh, in fact, when I, Sujata told me that Mr. Narayan is going to be there, as I said, uh, I was going to speak with a lot of trepidation, as I mentioned, because somebody who knows Calcutta better than I do, uh, what am I going to talk about? But anyway, I am really uh, grateful for the kind words, and I do hope I be able to talk about uh, Calcutta in, in uh, flattering terms. Because I see some of my uh, IIM friends here who lived in Calcutta at a time when Calcutta was at its nadir, I would say. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> that time and things were so bad over there that I think most of them had probably decided they were never going to go back there again. <laughs> That was the state of affairs, but fortunately, uh, things have improved over the years. And I would like to refer to it as Calcutta only, if it's okay with you people, since uh, that is part of our upbringing. And uh, although Kolkata, I mean, Calcutta rolls off the tongue much more easily than uh, Kolkata when you're speaking. So, uh, to start with, uh, uh, Thank you, Sujata, for having quoted about uh, Job Charnok. But uh, there is a bit of a controversy as far as that is concerned. Uh, in fact, the matter had to go to the High Court in Calcutta. And uh, the original owners of, or the zamindars of that land, which were the Savarna Roy Choudhury family, they ultimately got an order from the court saying that 24th, August 1690 is not the date of founding of Calcutta. So there is no date as such which is known. In fact, there are many uh, historical evidences. So one of them in his book, Mansa Mangal, written in 1495, Bipradas Pipli writes that a trader named Chand Sodagar passed through Kolikata to offer prayers to the goddess Kali at Kaligar temple in 1495. So there was a village called Kolikata, Sutanuti, Govindapur, they were all existing at that time. So the only thing you can probably say is that what we know now as the British part of this conglomerate was founded when he stepped into the, as I said, insalubrious mud flats of the river Hogli. So, and then again, subsequently, in his book, Ayne Akbari, Abul Fazal mentions Kolkata as a mahal in the Sarkar of Satgaon, together with two other villages. Together, they paid land revenue of Rs. 23,905, as recorded in the rent roll of Raja Todarmal in 1587. So, so there are references to Calcutta, Kolkata, Kolikata, which go back much before uh, uh, Job Charnok came. And of course, uh, we always maintain uh, uh, that uh, uh, on or around the 24th August 1690, Job Charnok, chief agent of the East India Company for Bengal, set foot once again on the insalubrious mud flats on the east bank of the river Hugli at Sutanuti after receiving permission from the Emperor Aurangzeb to establish a factory in Bengal. He chose the east bank, having learned from past experience that this place had the best defensible position and deep water anchorage. And Job Charnok was not new to Bengal. He has had served very effectively in the settlement at Kosim Bazar, which is near Murshidabad, uh, and was instrumental in curbing smuggling by some of his fellow compatriots and thus earning their ire. You know how corrupt the <laughs> British were? So the, the people who he, who, who's, he meddled in their affairs, so they got him transferred out. 
<laughs> that's an old uh, uh, this thing a bureaucracy bureaucratic act but anyway he was determined he came back to calcutta the third time he came and he uh, and he uh, and he was instrumental in coming smuggling and earning the he was then moved to bihar where he is said to have saved a young rajput princess from committing sati <coughs> at the funeral pyre of her late husband he subsequently married her and had a son and three daughters from her uh, so sutanuti govindapur and kolikata were the three villages for which he obtained the zamindari rights from the subarna roy choudhury family who owned that land and uh, then uh, one question here arises that we'll have to go back and forth a bit all the other european settlements were on the west bank of the hugli whereas he established this on the east bank and the only reason why he did this is because of as i mentioned a deeper port and a more indefensible area so when we go back we see that the portuguese came to bengal in 1518 and they stayed till 1633 1518 is before the moguls also came they were already there in bengal and they established their uh, set up in a place uh, which is now called bandal and uh, they also had a uh, they had a port a grande which was called uh, which is chitagong and this was called port porto piqueno or small port that was big port small port and uh, and they they came to uh, 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 they came before the moguls came to calcutta they established themselves in ugolim hugli and referred to the bhagirathi as the river of hugli the, this river was actually is bhagirathi it is the bhagirathi but in this stretch it is known as the hugli because they called it ugolim which is the river of hugli because their headquarters was in a area called hugli so it was the river of hugli which became river hugli otherwise it's the bhagirathi and the dutch came to bengal between 1635 and 1824 they were here for quite some time and they ultimately you know every time there was a war in europe between these european nations england and and france and england and this it all affected the uh, business activities of these trading companies here so at the end of their stay the dutch they came to, and they exchanged their properties in india with british properties in batavia which is indonesia so there were no dutch properties left in india and they all were transferred to the british then the third was the french who were in chandanagar till 1955 they went off only after they were uh, the the uh, the after independence and then the settlement took place with them and this was in chandanagar and uh, in pondicherry and then the other uh, power was the danish the danes were in uh, bengal in sirampur 1755 to 1845 their stay was not very long but they also all these people have left you know vestiges of built heritage in in, in the various towns in which they lived and they created in fact very recently uh, i don't know sir whether you had a chance to see the danish heritage which we restored the denmark tavern and all that that was with the danish government so that uh, uh, so these were the ma major settlements which were there in addition there were uh, short lived settlements of the prussians and flemish for a short while small settlements didn't last long so if i can show a small film on uh, the europe on the ganges this was all on the east bank the uh, west bank and all the british settlements came on the so you can have the a brief look at the film this was made about 25 years back with the assistance of the government of india ministry of tourism 
trying to develop heritage river tourism in West Bengal. It's only now that it has got going. But it is happening now. <laughs> there is some... The landing of Faso de Gama near Kozikor in 1498 heralded European colonization in India. Although they first landed on the west coast of India, they flourished in the riverine Gangetic plains of Bengal in the east, more specifically from Kolkata to Tribeni. It is a 60 kilometer stretch on the west bank of the Hooghly River. Portuguese traders selected Satgaon for their trading activity. Subsequently, they had opted for Hooghly, a prominent Mughal outpost. Hooghly Imambara, although built at a later date, reminds us of its glorious past, complete with rose garden, Turkish bath, sundial, etc. Portuguese Hooghly is the first European settlement established around 1537. The Hooghly River, as it is said, derived its name from the port Hooghly. Basilica at Bandal is the oldest church in Bengal. It is said that this church was once the place of worship for the ship navigators before leaving for the long hazardous journey. Dutch traders followed the Portuguese to Bengal and started their trading activity from Hooghly. They made their first factory at Golghat, but soon settled for a higher land at Chinsura on 20th March by virtue of a charter from the Dutch State General United East India Company of Netherlands was empowered treaties, war, and acquired properties for promoting their trade interest and built Fort Gustavas. However, in 1757, the British conquered Chinsura and the Fort Gustavas was destroyed and Chinsura was handed over to the British on the 7th of May, 1825. They have constructed a large barrack along the esplanade which is the main architectural feature of Chinsura today. Chinsura then became a fashionable suburb of Calcutta, where wealthy people spent their weekends and where European children were educated. The main building of present Hooghly Mahasin College was constructed in 1808. Although Chinsura was predominantly a Dutch settlement, other non-Indian settlements also flourished here. The Armenian church in Mughal Tuli built in 1695 by Koja Yunus Margo, is the second oldest church in Bengal. There are graves of descendants of the Armenian monarchy inside the compound of this church. Dutch governors were known for their parties and extravagant lifestyles. Local merchants acted as the suppliers of local goods to the Dutch and also the distributors of the Dutch goods in Bengal. This arrangement had resulted in growth of Bengali merchant communities like the Dattas, Lahas and Maliks. The mausoleum of Susanna Anna Maria is probably the most beautiful example of the European architecture in Chinsura. The French secured permission from Saista Khan, then the governor of Bengal, in 1690-91 and settled in Chandirnagar. Having derived its name from the crescent shape of the shoreline, Chandirnagar is a very strategic location on the river Hooghly. Although the French were late starters, they maintained a very long presence in Bengal. Their identity is being reflected in the layout and architecture of Chandirnagar. The strand or key duplex is an excellent promenade along the river bank and it is the focus of the French settlement on which stands the beautiful buildings like the Porsche Thistle Hotel, the Clock Tower, the Governor's House, the Convent. French Chandernagar had seen its golden period during the French governor, Francois Duplex. He transformed Chandernagar into the most beautiful city on the west bank of the Hooghly. One can still see its glimpses in the authentic architectural representation. The popular French icon of Joan of Arc still forms an important artifact in the town. The city life of Chandernagar reverberates with French culture. 
It celebrates Bastille Day by erecting an ornamental gateway at the entrance of the town on GT Road. The town was maintained by a council and enjoyed proper municipal services. The Sacred Heart Cemetery on the west side of Lal Digi still shares French past in the graves and mausoleums. On the east of Lal Digi stood the Fort de Orleans, built by the French in 1697 to protect and strengthen their trade interest. After the Peace of Paris in 1763, Chandel Nagar was restored to the French and remained with them till 1950. The bakery, the bandstand, the convent, the layout of the streets of Chandel Nagar still reminds us of its French past. The Danes arrived in Bengal with Farman from Ali Bardi Khan, the Nawab of Bengal. They settled in Serampur. The history of this town has been painted on the walls of the governor's house to commemorate its 150 years. Although it is popularly known as Serampur, the Danes identified it as Frederick's Nagar. Initially, this was a very low-profile town, but transformed into a prominent European settlement. Nishan Ghat, with its cannons, promenade along the river bank, made an impressive facade of the town. The most important feature of this town is the St. Olaf Church, constructed at the anchor point of the Vista. The settlement was controlled from the governor's house, situated on the strand near Nishan Ghat. What made the Danes special is not their quality of trade or their political might, but their social cultural activities. They had a lasting impression on Bengal's cultural history. The establishment of the Baptist Mission in 1860 was the trendsetter in this regard. The Serampur Mission took the lead in setting up of educational institutions and printing press in the town. In 1816, they initiated a college to teach young people Eastern literature and European science. It got an official recognition through a charter from Frederick VI, and thus the first college in Asia was formed. An impressive building in pure European style symbolizes the historical achievement. Serampur Printing Press began to publish books both in English and vernacular languages. With the publication of the Bible in Bengali, Bengali literature entered into a new era. The newspaper Samachar Darpan was also initiated from this press. Kerry House, Serampur Cemetery, Serampur College, Baptist Church are important edifices of Danish Serampur. Even the almost ruined Henry Martin Pagoda by the side of the river symbolizes the true linkage of European activities and a Bengali soul. Far away from Europe, a new culture was born out of these activities and interactions on the banks of the river Ganges. So we come back to Bengal now from Europe. So uh, I will also like to add to what uh, Sujata mentioned about the Calcutta's choice of uh, capital. So uh, Rudyard Kipling said some very nasty things about Calcutta. So he said, thus the midday halt of Charnock, mows the pity, grew a city, as the fungus sprouts chaotic from its bed, so it spread. Chance directed, chance erected, laid and built on the silt. Palace, buyer, hovel, poverty and pride side by side. And above the packed and pestilential town, death looked down. This is from his book called Rudyard Kipling's A Tale of Two Cities where he compares Calcutta and Simla. So he had these, all these, of course he was no lover of India anyway, so we don't have to give it much credence. And But then even uh, this H.E.A. Cotton, who has written uh, Calcutta Old and New, he takes, he says, take your map of India and find, if you can, a more uninviting spot than Calcutta. 
placed in the burning plain of Bengal on the largest delta of the world, amidst a network of sluggish, muddy streams in the neighborhood of the jungles and the marshes of Sundarbans, and yet so distant from the open sea as to miss the benefits of the breeze. It unites every condition of a perfectly unhealthy situation. The place is so bad by nature that human efforts could do little to make it worse. So in spite of all this negativity, Calcutta became the second city of the British Empire. So there must have been something in it, no? I mean, uh, after all, there was money there. The trade was enormous in textiles, in spices, in saltpeter, and I mean, you name it, whatever was exportable went out from Calcutta. So in spite of the bad weather, pestilence, the whatever, they came in droves. So, uh, and other than that, in the early stages of growth, the city grew chance directed, chance erected, as Rudyard Kipling has said. It evolved in, uh, organically and not with any planning process to monitor its growth. The main factors influencing growth were defense, security, and trade. This, and, and mind you, a, the Calcutta was at the, was the first port uh, which anybody entering the Hooghly from the sea encountered. It was only after that that the Danish and the other settlements uh, came up. They were upriver. So these guys were sitting right in the top of the <laughs> uh, port area. So uh, since the north-south divide was already coming into place, the Indian population started expanding northwards along the river as well as more due to religious reasons, bathing in the Ganga being an important factor. Indigenous settlements also grew around the Chiteshwari temple in the north and Kaligahat in the south. These settlements earned the sobriquet of the black town. Within the black towns, there were further divisions on the basis of caste and ethnicity. Non-Bengali business communities predominantly occupied the Badabazar area. Specific forms of urbanism developed and a specific built environment was created to meet the contradictory requirements of various groups operating under colonialism. This specific form was of a duality in which two radically, uh, racially segregated parts of Paths presented vastly different layouts. The duality gave the impression of almost two different towns. In Calcutta, it is important to note that between the European and the Indian settlements, there was an area defined as the Grey Town, which was inhabited by the Armenians, Jews, Parsis, and of course Chinese, which is uh, also uh, something very unique because in 1848, uh, at, at the time of Warren Hastings, he gave the he was the he was the governor general at that time, and he gave a parcel of land to one Chinese uh, migrant called Tong Achi, and that place is still called Achipur, who set up a sugar mill there. Imagine in those days, he set up a sugar mill and that sugar mill, in fact, that is what legend says that the word for sugar colloquially is chini. So it comes from the Chinese people who were there. Otherwise, it was called shakkar. In North India, chini uh, sugar is called shakkar. So here it was called chini because of the Chinese influence. So, uh, so the Chinese, in fact, there was a thriving Chinese community in India till 1962. At, uh, the, during that uh, Chinese uh, aggression, uh, a lot of them had to be deported and all that. So, uh, but there's still a Chinatown in Calcutta. There's a Chinatown, uh, the two Chinatowns in Calcutta. There's the old Chinatown in central Calcutta called Tiriti Bazaar and Tangra. And as those of you who have visited Calcutta in the past, Chinese shoes were very famous in those days. And Chinese restaurants all started from Calcutta only. So that is uh, mainly about the Cal Calcutta, how it is grown. I'll just show you a little bit of the grandeur of Calcutta. 
I've spoken a lot about the pestilence of Calcutta, but <laughs> maybe I need to show you the flip side also. Okay, this is, I've already gone through all this. Uh, in his magnum opus, Splendors of the Raj, Philip Davy is a well-known heritage conservation expert and director of English heritage, gave this epithet. He called it the gifted city, which uh, probably we don't realize it. And it, it was the only city in the world to be the political and commercial capital of a country apart from London. Calcutta soon patterned its edifices on a style resembling uh, London to signify the power and grandeur which the British wished to convey, as uh, Mr. Narayanan has very kindly mentioned. In this plethora of architecture styles, which we are going to be shown in the next few slides. So, in London, there is a church in Trafalgar Square called St. Martin in the Fields. And most of the churches in Calcutta, definitely, probably a lot in India, were patterned on this uh, church. So this is St. Martin's in the Field in London, in Trafalgar Square. And this is St. Andrew's Church in next to Writer's Building in, in the main BBD Bag area. And this is St. John's Church, the first cathedral church in Calcutta, which was, uh, uh, it's, all, it's, it's called Pathor Girja. Pathor means stone. Stone, incidentally, is not a local... Uh, material of construction in, in Bengal. So that's why they took Charnakite from here to Calcutta. So and this they started building the uh, spire with that stone. And because the soil is soft there, it can't take that load. So it started sinking. So they had to truncate that uh, spire. That's why it looks a bit squat, yes. <laughs> This is a synagogue. This is a Greek Orthodox Church. So just showing you a few of the different styles which were, which are still there, very much there. This is a mosque. This is the Belurmat. And this is a composite architectural style. It has a lot of uh, various styles mixed in it. This is a Jain temple. So each one is unique. And other than that, just to give you an idea of the composite nature diversity of the city, we have Parsi fire temples, Chinese temples, Ismaili Jamaat Khanas, Bora Muslim mosques, Roman Catholic cathedrals, Brahmo Samaj temples, Buddhist temples, Armenian churches, and the list can go on. <coughs> this is, of course, Mr. Narayan's residence. <laughs> you would have had a tough time getting the people to look after me. <laughs> House help would have been difficult. <laughs> this was built in 1803 by Lord Wellesley. Uh, who lost his job because he spent so much money on it. <laughs> and it was uh, inspired by Kettleston Hall, Derbyshire, which is the uh, country home of Lord Curzon. This is a town hall in Calcutta. This is an old silver mint which is also, it's not in use at the moment, but it has some magnificent buildings. Wish we could do something about it. We are trying to put it to adaptive reuse. These are the various, uh, you know, architectural styles which are still there in Calcutta. This is the currency building. This is the dead letter office. This is the general post office. This is the high court. All functional buildings, all of them are functional buildings. This is St. Paul's Cathedral, again Gothic. This is the Shaheed Minar, earlier known as the Octoloni Monument. Again, it has a combination of 
uh, architectural elements. This is the Art Deco. Most of these cinema halls uh, cease to be cinema halls. They are now either becoming malls or they are uh, put it to some use or just lying vacant. This is the Art Deco. There was a substantial Art Deco movement all over Calcutta in the 20s and 30s. A lot of these buildings are still there, but many are going one by one. We are trying to save them. This is the Art Novo style. This is the Victorian. <laughs> this is a typical uh, Bengali Babu style, as they call it, the Bengali Baroque. And uh, this is the courtyard. And this is where the Babus had their Durga Pujas uh, every year. This is Sova Bazaar. I don't know where you went to Sova Bazaar, sir. This is Marble Palace, one of the grandest ma private mansions in, uh, that I have ever seen. Not a palace, but it's a mansion. It's a, a living uh, history. This is the Belgachia Villa, which was the Tego. One of the Tegos used to own it, but it's in ruins now. So that's the trip around Calcutta. And uh, if you, as uh, Mr. Narayanan mentioned, I'm sure this would interest people to come and have a look at the city with the uh, styles which are still there to see. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, my name is Siva Sailam. I'm an old Calcutta, lived there for about 25 years, uh, but living in Chennai for the last 30 years. <laughs> now, when I uh, read about uh, Calcutta's uh, restoration of uh, glory, there was a new concept. I think you are also part of it, I was told. The TDRs, the transfer of development rights. Uh, as far as old buildings are concerned, they don't want old buildings to be demolished, but the owner wants it for space for further development. So you don't develop. So for non-development, they allow you a TDR. It is not TDR for development, it is TDR for non-development. How effective it is? Why I am asking, uh, similar situation arises in this city. Nobody wants to part with this old building, he wants to demolish it. Because he doesn't get any incentive to maintain it. What is your experience on what are the lessons learnt out of this uh, uh, Calcutta experiment? It's a very, very important point that you've raised. TDR is something we are still working on. We have not been able to, uh, you know, freeze it. But we feel that it is the only incentive, as you said rightly, that in, unless you give an incentive to a building owner, why should he want his building to be declared a heritage? Because he loses all his uh, monetary benefits. He, can't se he can sell the building, but then uh, if nobody can develop uh, on that parcel of land, then he gets nothing out of it. So we have prepared a, a proposal and we are still in discussion with the KMC, the Kolkata Municipal Corporation, but uh, we have not come to any conclusion. The two cities where this is probably working is Mumbai and Ahmedabad. In Kolkata, it is not yet uh, in operation. It's an active discussion, and we are trying to be, uh, trying to get some incentive uh, built into the system so that we can save these buildings. Thank you. Yes, please. What is the history of educational institutions in Kolkata? What is the history of educational institutions? In Calcutta. Well, uh, the history of education institutions, uh, the Calcutta University was one of the first universities uh, which was set up in the country by the British. So, uh, sorry? It was simultaneously. Simultaneously, yes. 
and uh, so it is uh, I mean started off a uh, long time back and other than that a lot of uh, colleges were set up a lot of uh, schools were set up a lot of Christian missionary schools were set up then uh, these schools by uh, you know the Brahmo Samaj, Ar Samaj all these were set up in they, they, uh, educational institutions Right down, uh, right from day one, I think they have been active. There are plenty of educational institutions which have a lot of historical uh, background. Presidency College, which is now a university, is also one of the oldest uh, uh, institutions. St. Xavier's College is there. I mean, there are, there are enough uh, education institutions with a lot of history and heritage. The three universities, Bombay, Madras and Calcutta, mm. coincidentally set up in the same year the as same the first year. war of independence, which was then yeah, called the yeah, And Calcutta University had jurisdiction right up to Lahore. I mean, at that time there were no there were no universities from between Calcutta and Lahore. Then slowly over a period of time, in fact, Calcutta also a writers' building, I would say, had jurisdiction uh, at one time all the way from Aden in the west and Singapore in the east, Penang. And the Church of uh, England, the Diocese of Calcutta had jurisdiction even uh, Sydney in Australia. So they will imagine this guy sitting in uh, Raj Bhavan in Calcutta <laughs> had so much power. Yes, please. Singapore is the metropolitan building in heritage building in Calcutta? Yes, it is, yes. It is protected? It is protected, yes. In yeah, yeah. It, it, in fact, that is one of the buildings where Intac had to go to court, file a PIL to ensure against its demolition. It is owned by LIC, and uh, there was a active uh, plan to demolish it. So that's what we had heard. So we went to court, we filed a PIL, and we got uh, a stay. That, and they confirmed that they will not be demolished. The other tragic part is what is happening outside the Grand Hotel. Uh, that is very sad. <laughs> it's very sad. Such a mess. A, that is politics for you. What can you do about it? In fact, there are hardly any pavements in Calcutta where you can walk properly. You had a question. Hi, uh, my name is Chandni and I grew up in Calcutta, so obviously I have a lot of fondness for the city, I, though I have been out of uh, Calcutta for almost 30 years now. Uh, my question to you was, though I've grown up in Calcutta, honestly a lot of this I, I myself wasn't aware of. And I would actually like to go back and explore the city as a tourist, as somebody who grew up there. What, what would you suggest? What would be a suggested itinerary? You also spoke about river tourism. So is, is there something like that? Like through a river cruise, you can grow, go through Bengal and explore Bengal. Uh, regarding... Whatever you showed, I knew the Kaligar Temple very well because I stayed in Kaligar. Mm. Otherwise, going into the north and seeing Chandan Nagar or Serampur, we are never done. Why don't we have a tourist? Uh, yes, we could all come. <laughs> <laughs> we could organize one. We could all come. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it can be organized. There's no problem. I'll tell you that uh, Sujata can take the lead. Let her organize it here. We, no, we'll do that end. You can handle this end. Uh, I'll tell you what, we had started this heritage walks in Calcutta way back, uh, maybe to 20, 25, 25 years back. And now it has become institutionalized. For us, it was free. 
we had volunteers who would take people around and show them places. And now it has become institutionalized and professionalized. So people are charging and they are taking people. So that is one way which anybody, whenever, if you land up in Calcutta, look up Calcutta walks or something and you'll find somebody, phone them, they will pick you up and take you and they'll charge a fee. Yeah, that's fine. But so that's so. <laughs> yes, and then you take. <laughs> I'll give you this presentation. You tell them I want to see everything. In there. <laughs> no. See, Intag is a voluntary organization. You know, so for us to find somebody all the time, whenever you land up there, that volunteer must be free. Also, it may not be possible. So, but we can give you all the we can give you all this uh, information, which you can uh, ask that uh, guy to take you around. Yeah, yeah, they, they walk. Yeah, that you have to organize. <laughs> and as far as even the river heritage cruises are already on. They, they're taking people. They say from Calcutta, they'll take you to Belur Mart. They'll take you to... Yeah, I've been there. You've been there. By boat? By ship. Ah, wait. But not the ship, I don't mind. Uh, big boat. Big boat. Launch. Yeah. Okay. There's a question this side too. Yeah. yeah, just an addition. We took the Calcutta walks, and they give you a quite a comprehensive list of you can pick and choose. So that's just an addition. No, I'm just curious about the dead letter building. Yeah. What's happening? Dead letter building is uh, still there with the post office. They I don't know what they're going to do with it because now the, nobody writes letters, so all letters are dead anyway. <laughs> no, even the concept of a dead letter building, oh. where you know letters that are not delivered. Yeah, that was what the concept was. Yeah. But now that building is lying vacant, it's with the post office. They're trying to find some reuse for it. I don't know. The letters are gone. Those letters have gone long back. I don't think those letters. Why is it called dead letter? Yeah, it was called dead letter because those letters were dead. They were. They did. I mean, at least the recep recipients, so-called recipients, were dead. Probably. That's why they were called dead letters. Actually, they, they couldn't be delivered to the addressee. So, they, they came back to the post office. So, post office said what to do with them. So, they, they dumped them in the dead letter office. Returned letter office, actually. It was returned letter office. <laughs> uh, excuse me, ma'am. You asked about uh, Sixth, River Cruise, correct. right? Sorry. Far Horizon, a travel agency from Delhi, Organize, uh, organizes in their uh, luxury uh, but, uh, trips on Brahmaputra. I think they even do a seven days few. trip. Uh, starting somewhere in Assam and ending up in Hooghly. Yeah. Yeah, I think they they organize it for foreign tourists. Might be quite expensive, but if you're interested, you could uh, get in touch with them. You had a question, sir? Uh, good evening to all. Uh, so glad uh, to, you know, know because I grown up in Calcutta, uh, educated in Calcutta, being a Bengali, uh, here uh, staying in Chennai since 2012. And, uh, you know, we have, I'm the secretary of Bengal Association, Tinagar. And listening to all this, first of all, is so, so, you know, glad I'm so, my, you know, getting goosebumps that you, you all having so, you know, curious about Kolkata, sir has come all the way from Kolkata to say, uh, I actually grown up, uh, you know, seeing sir's, uh, you know, photo in the TVs and all those stuff, sir, Narayanan. So, uh, to you, for your information, we are planning something, uh, you know, with the TTDC and, uh, you know, uh, West Bengal Tourism to, you know, have a Calcutta ride, something from, uh, you know, Chennai. Because we get a lot of queries uh, from, uh, you know, you all. Uh, we do Posh Mela and all others, all, all this. So, thank you, thank you, Intact, for, you know, organizing this. And uh, thank you all that you have so much of fond memories, uh, you know, from Calcutta. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah, so I have a question on the bigger issue of, uh, you know, architecture. Uh, and as you pointed out, some of these buildings were designed to, you know, impress people with the grandeur of empire. I've heard buildings in China, for example, are designed to make the individual feel insignificant. And so these are wonderful buildings and I 
really admire them. The architecture of our own city, Chennai, is so beautiful. But at the same time, there is this risk that we romanticize the, that colonial era. How should we balance these things out where we can appreciate without feeling somehow that that was a better time than these current times? So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. My thoughts on this are very clear. I, I am not romanticizing them at all. I am looking at them as, uh, let's say, pieces of grandeur, grand architecture. It's nothing, if, if, even if it was Russian architecture, it was grand, I would still appreciate it. I am not linking it to the British Raj in India that the British built such beautiful building. I, on a standalone basis, this building is something which should be admired. That's what we, we restored two monuments in Calcutta. One is the Princep Memorial and the other is the, uh, no, not Victoria, we didn't do this. Uh, there was a Gwalior Monument. These buildings were both to commemorate some Britisher. Okay. But we restored them as landmarks of the city that they add to the beauty and grandeur of the city. Nothing, to, we are not trying to highlight, ki, oh, this was because so and so was such a great Britisher white man. We were not highlighting that aspect. This building is still looking good in, in its present surroundings. And uh, people are enjoying that uh, environment. That is uh, my outlook. I don't know how others look at it. But I would suggest that this is the way you should look at it. That don't try to, you know, uh, think of them as past glories. They are your city's assets. That's the way I see it. I mean, I don't know whether you agree with me or not. No, I do. And just... Uh Wondering about the, you know, somebody who hasn't taken the trouble to understand maybe the history just looks at the building, and then there is this tendency to say that you know, oh, you know, British times were so great because they built these great buildings, but there was also, you know, times of great inequity and exploitation and so on, which we forget sometimes when we see these buildings. So I worry sometimes. No, that, that I agree with you yeah. there. What I'm saying is, see, they were built at a time when those were the architectural styles. So when they were making buildings, suppose. That way the Mughals also built so many buildings. They built them in their style. At that time, Mughal architecture was what was prevalent. And there was inequity that time as well. It wasn't that everybody was uh, rich and wealthy. So it's, I mean, it's, it's a pa passage of history. You don't have to eulogize. You don't have to, you know, make romanticize. You don't have to do all that about it. It was there. And... It, if there's an ugly building from that era, then break it down. <laughs> That's what I feel. You don't have to protect that. Thank I you. Just add yes. that. Yeah. So what he was asking, I think every layer of history, every period is important mm -hmm. to where we are today, okay. to, in, in that journey. So it's not about British or it's not about the Mughals or the Cholas or whatever, but every layer is a layer of history upon which we built up and we are what we are as a result of all that. So if you can appreciate it with Hello. respect to where it stands in history, I think it makes sense. Hi sir, I just want to know the architectures of temples because you accept the Kali temples. Do you know any other temple architecture in Kolkata? And I want to add on uh, globe I think is the oldest cinema, which is still functioning. And uh, in the pictures, uh, there is no Victoria Memorial. That yeah. And Why wasn't Victoria, Victoria, Victoria Memorial? Memorial is something everybody knows. So no. I wanted to highlight uh, buildings which are lesser known. I mean, <laughs> Havla uh, Bridge. I could have shown Havla Bridge also. So <laughs> what's the big deal? And Toliganj, Baliganj uh, significance in what about Toliganj, Baliganj? Architectural significance of Taliganj, Baliganj in Kolkata. Do you no, have any information? There are areas. Uh, yeah, there are areas. And, uh, but what is the architectural significance depending on the those areas? Baliganj is a residential area. So, they have shown a lot of uh, art deco houses of Baliganj and Taliganj and all that. You know, I have shown a lot of, uh, yeah, yeah. of that era. Currently, now, it's a very nondescript high-rise buildings, bungalows and all that. And nothing very exciting. To my mind, I don't know, architects might have a different view. <laughs>
Yeah, you had a question? Yeah, after. The West Bengal, uh, the Calcutta business was mostly done by non-Bengalis. When did they enter Bengal? Oh, they, they entered Bengal uh, in the time of Sirajud Dawla and Ali Wardi Khan in Murshidabad. They were the bankers to the, the, these Jains from um, uh, Jodhpur in that area. They came to and settled down in uh, Murshidabad <coughs> and uh, that they were funding all the, uh, uh, you know, all the uh, episodes, of all the war and all that which these people used to indulge in, the Nawabs of Murshidabad. In fact, there was, this is, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, you must have read uh, William Dalrymple's book, Anarchy, where he talks about uh, <clears throat> this uh, Jagat Seth, right. Jagat Seth is the person who gave money, a bribe to uh, uh, Robert Clive and uh, this uh, uh, Mir Jafar to stay away when Sirajuddaula attacked Robert Clive. So not to support uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the attack on him. So that's the main reason why Robert Clive could defeat uh, Siraj uh, Hello, sir. My name is Dan. I have lived in Calcutta for two years. But I was four and five out of my age, so clearly don't remember much of it. But I think after your presentation, looking forward to going back. Thank you so much for this. Um, for me, right, um, probably a per, uh, a place of uh, importance in Calcutta uh, is Eden Gardens. So anything you can share about you know, who this Eden was and how uh, his gardens have become so important? Eden, actually, this is the Lord Auckland, whose sisters were Emily Eden and uh, they, they built a garden over there. It was called Eden Garden for them. But this cricket stadium is a much later addition. Okay. That right. whole garden, there's a big garden in Calcutta which is called Eden Gardens. gardens. And it was because they were des they designed it, and you know they they uh, laid it out and all that. It was a beautiful garden. It still is a beautiful garden. A lot a part of it was taken away for the stadium. All right. Thank you, sir. Sir, vast tracts of land here in Calcutta. Yes. Is it of any historical significance? In of significance? Are they doing anything? No, they're not doing it. They, they, that's what we are happy about. That they don't do anything. <laughs> Leave it like that. You see, when when after the after the uh, attack on the old Fort William by Sirajudola, after he ransacked it, that Fort William was destroyed. Original Fort William. So they decided that since they are to they are here to stay. They needed a strong fort. They needed strong defenses. So they shifted that to this side where it is now. And they, this area was a total jungle. So they cleared the jungle, created a fort area, and that's when this Chaurangi uh, was uh, laid out. So the high street of Chaurangi came about because the fort shifted from where it was earlier to this place. And they left this the open area, the Maidan, free from any uh, building. And it is in the law that no, nothing can, no permanent construction can take place on the Maidan because they wanted to have a clear line of sight. Anybody attacking the fort can, would be visible. In that case, because the fort was not, didn't have any clear line of sight, by the time they, they, they got to know that this uh, Sirajud Dola was uh, attacking, he was almost at their doorsteps. So they couldn't, couldn't prepare themselves. So now that, that's the law that they cannot, Ministry of Defense will not permit any construction on the Maidan. It's interesting that you have a bowling green to the Yeah. <laughs> There's a small uh, ladies' Calcutta golf club also on the Maidan. 
Sir, there are clubs are there. There are a lot of clubs there. You're right. Sir, you said there yeah. was not uh, many buildings built by stones. I want to know how the Hindu temples are built in the ancient days in Calcutta, and what is the condition now? Which is the first Hindu temple which was built then, in Calcutta, and which material they used? It? To and the best of my knowledge, the Kaligat temple is the oldest Hindu temple in Calcutta, and in Calcutta, uh, all temples were built with bricks. There are, not to my knowledge, the only couple of big government buildings which are built with stone is the High Court and the St. Uh, yeah, Paul's Cathedral, a few of them like that. But otherwise, all the buildings are all brick-built buildings. And uh, as I said, Kaligat, there was earlier Chitteshwari Temple, which was the original Kaligat Temple, and that Kaligat Temple was connected to this Kaligat Temple. These are the oldest temples that I know of. And they're all brick built. Yeah, but that's all brick. So I think we must bring this session to a close, though many of you would like to talk to Mr. Kapoor and get more information. I am sure he'll be happy to uh, you know, answer your questions. So it is my pleasant duty to thank all of you for being here today sharing in a part of our history and heritage. And uh, we thank the INTAC Chennai chapter for having uh, brought this occasion to the CIC and to all of you for being part of it. So we meet again during the next session. A major session which is coming up is our annual literature and arts festival. This would be on the 8th and 9th of December. 8th would be for young adult writers. And on the 9th, we will have three sessions, one on fiction, non-fiction, and on translation. So we hope to see all of you there. The venue would be for the 9th would be the Madras Music Academy, the mini hall there. So thank you very much. Would you like to say a few words? Uh, Again, thank you, Chennai International Center, for co-hosting this for us. And uh, I just wanted to add that um, I know there have been a lot of similarities between Madras and Calcutta, but even more so, I was struck when Mr. Kapoor spoke about so many things that are so similar to us. I mean, we are on the eastern seaboard, of course, but that the Danes were there, We've had the Danes here in Trankabar. We've had the Dutch in uh, Pulikat. We've had the French in Pondicherry. And of course, the British. And like Job Charnock's date is uh, doubted, our own founding of the city uh, or the so-called founding of the city is not supposed to be August 22nd, but some day has to be chosen to celebrate the birthday of a city. So that's what is chosen. And again, is that when Madras was born? Not at all. We've had, like the Pallavaram granite that we celebrate, we've had uh, a Paleolithic tool discovered by um, you know, Robert Bruce Foote, uh, in the, again in the Pallavaram area, which is going back to prehistory. So we've all been around for very, very long, and we are a very old civilization. It's not as if we started when the British came, but it's just that it's more in recent memory, and those dates are taken as the date from which our city is celebrated. But otherwise, you know, we've had the Pallavas, the Cholas, the Pandyas, all ruling and kingdoms, rising kingdoms, falling, all of this much way before 1639 when the British came here. So I was really struck by the, you know, various similarities other than, you know, the Pallavaram granite having gone from here. So thank you so much for that wonderful session. And I just wanted to say thank you to Mr. Narayan and request you to come and just receive a small token from us.